Well, thank you very much uh, for the viewers to uh, be interested enough to, to, to listen to this fourth of a series of presentations on um, which basically are trying to examine some criticisms of capitalism by offering an alternative interpretation where we'll have been uh, trying to, to uh, develop ideas on the strengths of capitalism. And of course, again, we're trying to answer these, these complaints. Um, to, to sort of set the stage for this, let me throw a few quotes out uh, uh, for you to, to consider. One of the things, I, I'm an economist primarily, and one of the things that uh, Henry Hazlitt in his wonderful work, uh, Economics in One Lesson, he reflects on an idea introduced by Friedrich Bastiat, uh, which is that economics is as much about what is not seen as what is seen. So we have to look behind, uh, for example, uh, the statements of public policy, what politicians or bureaucrats tell us are the intentions. Economics will give us some deeper insights into what are the results. Uh, in, and it goes deeper than just looking at intentions. Uh, the, uh, a trenchant um, uh, social observer, H.L. Mencken is a um, uh, well-known American journalist of the mid 20th century, uh, talked about politics um, as a way of keeping the population alarmed uh, so that it'd be easier for the uh, public authorities to offer some sort of uh, security to keep them uh, in a sense dependent on the, uh, on the state. And this idea then is, uh, it's problematic. Uh, uh, Randolph Bourne is, is said to have uh, made this following statement that war is the health of the state. In other words, war is the uh, extreme uh, situation where we have insecurity of the population and where the state acquires virtually unlimited power in general, based upon this sort of acquiescence or agreement with the, uh, uh, from the population. And this is very dangerous in the sense that uh, government policies tend to be, uh, have a, a ratcheting effect. That is, it's easy for them to go up, but it's very difficult for them to uh, disappear or to be reduced. And I think, uh, certainly, if we are looking at the um, current uh, pandemic policies, uh, that's a, a very important uh, consideration uh, to, to, to see how governments will uh, withdraw from the expansive uh, use of political power in the name of a pandemic. Uh, uh, one has very little optimism uh, that there'll be a retreat of the state on this regard. In any case, let's uh, now the first um, several lectures today we're looking at the relationship between capitalism and, and uh, nature or what we could call the natural en environment. Um, and the claim is often made that capitalism is, is a, um, a source of uh, degradation of the natural environment and that uh, it should be either somehow capitalism should be curbed, private property rights should be limited, individual freedom of choice should be restricted in order to promote the cause of uh, protecting or improving the natural environment. Uh, now, I'm going to, to sort of frame my discussion today from the perspective of looking at human agency, in other words, the individual choices, uh, individuals choosing based upon free will, based upon their subjective values, uh, based upon their uh, subjective determination of their life purposes, uh, and how those interactions among these free and responsible individuals compares with a, a, a different sort of set of conditions where instead of choices, human beings are making within an interactive process, uh, how those human interactions are impacted by government mandates, regulations, legislation, and so on, being those mandates. So the question then will be uh, several questions. First of all, 
is capitalism a cause or the primary cause or among many causes of uh, impact damage to the natural environment? And on the other hand, uh, if it is or if it is not, can it be the cure? That is, can capitalism be um, uh, expected to be a possible source of improving the conditions of the natural environment? On the other hand, uh, can governments, that is the state, uh, can they cause environmental damage, uh, damage to the natural environment, uh, nature that is? And on the other hand, can governments be expected to be the cure? So this leaves us with the following uh, general question. Now we all know that <clears throat> we've been uh, bombarded with a great deal of apocalyptic predictions about what will happen to the natural environment with respect, first of all, to what was called global warming, where uh, uh, the uh, global warming was supposed to uh, have reached the tipping point from which we would have no possible return. Uh, and this tipping point has been pushed farther and farther into the future. Uh, and these apocalyptic, uh, there's been, uh, in other words, uh, a retreat from these apocalyptic uh, forecasts once that particular uh, year had passed, but they uh, reinvented the same sort of declaration of apocalyptic uh, tipping points. So one has to begin to, to wonder wh whether or not we should believe these apocalyptic forecasts. And this is what I'll try to uh, uh, interpret as, uh, as we uh, pursue these discussions today. Now, let's start with an, an analysis of human actions. In other words, what has been the uh, tendency for human progress over uh, the, the centuries? So we're going to interpret what's happened to a certain degree in the past, but also what we can expect from the future. Now, I'm not sure how many in the audience might have read science fiction. Uh, when I grew up in the 1950s and 1960s, science fiction tended to be generally optimistic. And I think if you go back into the early 20th century and the late 19th century, if you look at H.G. Wells, uh, some of the early uh, science fiction writers or writers that are uh, that might have sort of dealt with these issues of science fiction. What we found is that there was generally an optimism about what was going to happen in the future. People uh, uh, were portrayed as, uh, in, in my youth, uh, flying around in private uh, cars that, that could fly, uh, that um, in general we saw, and we have seen that human indicators and certainly since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution or the beginning of the uh, 20th century or the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, living standards, all these human indicators, living standards, the material well-being, uh, infant mor mortality, life expectancy, they are generally improving. Uh, now, it's, of course, it's not linear. There'll be uh, setbacks. I mean, the, the pandemic, uh, cause setbacks in some of these uh, human indicators, but most of that is the outcome of the public policy uh, path rather than the pandemic per se. The, uh, uh, it, it's hard to make a counterfactual, but it's almost certain that with, with a different set of uh, public policies in response to the pandemic, that we would have had different, and I would suggest better outcomes in terms of most of the uh, human indicators. Now, uh, so there was also this expectation that the future would bring even more opportunities for this flourishment this, uh, of, of humanity, that humanity could look forward to better days. So for example, scientists were seen as uh, individually and collectively introducing uh, technological advancements uh, or being at the forefront of technological advancements. Uh, medical advancements and so on <clears throat> that have made life easier. 
have made life better and have made our lives uh, longer. On the other hand, entrepreneurs, uh, the, the private sector uh, uh, market-driven entrepreneurs uh, have been able to provide us with more, cheaper, and better products or services over time. So if we look at uh, what was available uh, at the beginning of the 20th century for the normal working person, uh, working class, blue collar workers, what they had available and what the, the, uh, uh, their livelihood, their ability to consume, uh, uh, it was infinitely better at the beginning of the 21st century uh, in virtually every country, um, with the exception of those countries where you might have had uh, massive state intervention or uh, advanced socialism. Now, unfortunately, what we see now in more modern times uh, is that there's a, a, a sort of a resilient pessimism and a sort of exaggerated sense of aversion to losses that have led people to believe the future is not going to be better, but it's going to be bleaker. That is, we have this sense of a dystopian future and an, another associated aspect of that. And I think these go hand in hand and they're, 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 they co-mingle, that is they're interdependent. There tends to be a widespread acceptance or belief that governments can and should intervene to make our lives better in the future. That is they, they can, that is they will be effective in doing so and they should, that is there's not a better alternative so this seems to have become a sort of uh, received wisdom, which has gained ground and which is in many ways is what this series of four lectures is about, trying to question the fact that the state can or should uh, intervene to try to make people's lives better. The, the, the question, of course, is not whether or not people's lives should be better. The question is whether the state can achieve that, whether state interventions, regulations, subsidies, uh, legislative intervention can actually achieve that. Uh, I've tried to introduce a certain amount of skepticism about the capacity of the state uh, to be able to achieve those uh, wonderful ends. We've seen lots of op opportunities in the past where states have uh, engaged in those very uh, actions and they failed miserably. Uh, as they did in the Soviet Union when they tried to remake mankind, uh, mainland China, uh, Cuba at the present time, North Korea as well. Uh, so we've seen lots of attempts where the state took in hand to uh, that it should and it could improve uh, the, the, the lot, the condition of humanity. Now, what's happened in, in modern times, it, it seems to be a an increased fear of science rather than an admiration for science. So that we're either uh, worried increasingly that science can be used for control, but in fact, it's not science that's controlling people. It's public policy manipulating science to control people. Uh, or people have become afraid that uh, advancements in science, in particular artificial intelligence, AI, uh, will make humans uh, superfluous, that we won't uh, any longer be necessary, that we'll, uh, uh, what we do and what we can do will be overtaken by robots or by some superior artificial intelligence. And another complaint that uh, has gained a great deal of traction is that too many people have too much and too many have too little. In other words, this is this issue of income and wealth inequality that we discussed in an earlier presentation. And I won't really go into details on that because that's been covered. Uh, so ironically, what we're seeing is that human progress is its own worst enemy in the sense that as we become more and more comfortable and we've worry less and less about a, uh, a, a future of starvation or of, uh, of, of illnesses, because many of these things have been taken care of by either scientific advancement or entrepreneurial uh, activities, that there's a, a sort of, we have a luxury 
to, to contemplate uh, our, our condition. And there's a tendency to be somewhat self-critical because, well, of course, it's not perfect. Uh, how can it be made better? And by uh, describing or investigating how to make it better, one develops a, perhaps a, a, a moral superiority in, in your sort of position. You're suggesting that, well, you care more about the condition of humanity than other people do, uh, and that you believe that the best way for humanity to be advanced is for the state to be involved in limiting the range of choice, the, the freedom of action, because human, other, other humans other than you are, are not to be trusted. That there is there's some fundamental problem with, uh, with um, human agency that can and should be corrected by government interventions, social engineering, in other words. Now, let's look at some of the human action, the results of human actions. Uh, for example, let's look at some of the problems that might be caused by, by humans uh, living out their lives, trying to make their lives better. Um, now, there will be systematic failures. That is, people uh, are unable to uh, predict the future. Uh, with any sort of uh, certainty. We are imperfect in the, the sense that we uh, are, are not perfectly moral human beings. Uh, so we will see a perpetual set of mistakes that generally they're systematic in the sense that they persist over time. Uh, that is, each new generation will make its own mistakes, perhaps, and this will lead to inefficiencies. But what we'll discuss in a moment is that if there are some self-adjusting mechanisms that will trigger a, a, uh, uh, a remedial response, that is to correct those failures, then we can escape from uh, at least until the next set of mistakes come along. And since these are not universal necessarily, that is they don't affect every human being uh, in terms of the um, the, the, these sort of problems, uh, we can, uh, over time, um, uh, reduce the impact. Now, on the other hand, we can see catastrophic failures when we have collective government choices. Uh, so, again, uh, governments are not perfect, and they're not perfectly bad, but they're certainly not perfectly good. But what we see is that when there are failures of governments, those tend to be more catastrophic because they affect virtually the entire population, or the, including the population perhaps of another country or the entire globe with respect to wars. Um, so when governments make mistakes, unlike in the private sector, they tend to have a much wider impact because they are policies which govern the, through the legislative or the bureaucratic process, the lives and the um, choices of the entire population. So if there are problems, they are much more widespread. Now, how do we resolve these problems? So again, uh, humans are imperfect, uh, left to their own devices, they will make mistakes. Uh, the mistakes uh, that they make, uh, will generally be solved through voluntary cooperation. Uh, if, if I make a mistake in terms of uh, choosing the wrong product or choosing the wrong productive process, uh, the impact of that mistake will be borne by me or by those generally around me, uh, limited to those people around me. So this voluntary cooperation provides a possibility for a much more inclusive experimentation or testing so that we can discover the best path forward. Um, so everyone can be involved because this is the whole idea of a, an individualist society of people, uh, free and responsible individuals looking for a way for each and every one of them to have the best outcomes without interfering with other people's quest or search for the best outcome for them.
Uh, now, this tends to be self-regulating uh, because the, the system of, for example, property rights under the rule of law provides incentives uh, to, to align personal incentives with the incentives of other people, that is the other actions of other people. Uh, now, on the other hand, if a centralized elite is addressing the problems, uh, they will tend to impose subjectively uh, chosen solutions. That is, there's no objective right way forward. Uh, and once those uh, are chosen, those uh, policies that come up tend to be very rigid and they are not inclusively tested. They are, even if they, the citizens are disappointed with the outcome, it's very difficult to communicate that disappointment in the way that you could in the marketplace. In the marketplace, you can immediately stop uh, inter, uh, interacting with someone who goes against your interests. But with the state, uh, it's much more difficult outside of immigration uh, to, to um, leaving the country to, to communicate your um, dissatisfaction. And it's very difficult to get the ruling authorities to reverse themselves because that communication process is uh, not very effective. So what happens is it's very difficult and slow uh, because of the incentives of the political agents, that is the politicians and the bureaucrats. Now, what we find is that there is a strong incentive for politicians and bureaucrats to overreact to a, a, a certain uh, risk level, whether we're talking about pandemics uh, and uh, public health, or if we're talking about the natural environment. The, the, the thing is, democratically elected uh, officials uh, do not want to be blamed for failures uh, that, uh, that they, for example, in the case of um, uh, the pandemic, they don't want to be blamed for uh, deaths and have not having done something to try to avoid them. So this creates a very strong incentive for them to intervene in areas where it may not be helpful, but the fact that they're doing something protects them against certain criticism. So they're encouraged to do more than perhaps they should. So why do we tend to accept the state as a remedy for some of these problems that we might see, whether they're uh, from the natural environment or uh, threats to public health. Well, part of it's hubris. Uh, now, it's hubris on the part of the politicians. Uh, they're, uh, one of the, the, the governor of New York State, Mario Cuomo, is a very proud and, and, and self-assured individual. He really believes he knows the answers and he projects that. And, and that is what gives people the confidence to vote for him. Now, it turns out he's made enormous mistakes in uh, making decisions about uh, uh, the pandemic policies in the state of New York that influenced, by the way, other governors of other states. Uh, so hubris makes politicians believe that they have better information, more information, the right information that uh, is not available to others. But also there's a certain hubris of human beings now that we, we've we advanced to the point where, uh, you know, we're, uh, we no longer accept a uh, supreme being, a God, uh, uh, in the same way that uh, might have been present in uh, the general discourse of 100 or 200 years ago. So man becomes his own God, that we we ourselves have become hubristic as a, as a race. At the same time, we see that there are uh, philosophical or ideological sort of positions that, uh, that try to provide, uh, uh, to suggest that the uh, state was State interventions, government interventions were both uh, necessary and effective. For example, central planning was seen uh, following Marx, uh, Karl Marx's idea that uh, control of the economy should be given over to the state. Uh, and uh, John Maynard Keynes and his uh, uh, economic theories 
suggested that the markets were not to be trusted, that um, we would need uh, the state to, to come in to correct market failures, to correct uh, uh, involuntary unemployment and underemployment, and that the state can and should, it would be effective in doing so. Um, so in a sense, what we see is that we can trace back certainly to, or we can go back to uh, uh, Rousseau or, or other earlier thinkers, uh, classical philosophers, the state is a solution looking for a problem. And the environment was, is a, a problem. So there we go. Let's find out how the state can fix it. Or the pandemic, there's a problem. Well, let's see how the state can fix it. So there's a presumption there that the state is a solution, find a problem, and then work out the, the best uh, uh, method for the state to be involved because it can and it should intervene. And when it does, it will solve the problem rather than make the problem worse. Uh, in fact, I I'm going to suggest to you as this uh, presentation develops that in most instances that the state intervention that was designed as a cure has actually made things worse. So now it, what I suspect you know, has happened over time is that the those people who favored the state over human beings, that is that they trusted a centralized elite to come up with better uh, directions for the course of human behavior, that individual humans were either inadequate or imperfect or uh, not to be trusted. Um, now, those who believe that is a general uh, approach to social science were disappointed that their arguments, for example, Marxism, uh, failed to create enough alarm among the other people, except, for example, in the Soviet Union, where they were able to, a, a dedicated elite was able to uh, impose its will uh, over the, the government of, of then Russia, Tsarist Russia, and to turn the entire population in the economy towards a uh, Marxist-Leninist experiment that, uh, that led to disastrous results. Now, so what we've seen is that now it's another try. The state is a solution. What's, what is a problem that we could really get people to get behind? Well, environmentalism uh, has become one of those issues. And I think, uh, again, I think an interdependent issue here will be the pandemic policies. And I'll try to connect the two in a moment. Um, but the idea of threats to the natural environment, that is nature, uh, is uh, the blame is laid at the feet of capitalism. And so if capitalism is at fault, then state intervention uh, should be uh, and could be the solution. So, what we're faced with is that we've seen the, the uh, idea that economic growth is unsustainable, uh, that it is uh, necessarily and unavoidably, supposedly the primary cause behind the degradation of the natural environment. But the reality is, Economic growth is the basis of prosperity, and prosperity provides both the incentive, that is the motivation for conservation, as well as the means for solutions, that is uh, trying to fix the problem or trying to uh, 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 improve the overall condition of the natural environment. And what we've seen is that what, if we look throughout history, uh, we see that the development of uh, industrial capitalism has led to a certain amount of environmental degradation. But over time, we've seen a continuation, a trend towards an improvement. Uh, so, for example, uh, if we go back to uh, the beginning of the 19th century, London was a, 
very polluted city and it remains so uh, until perhaps the end of the 20th century. But what we see is that as the Industrial Revolution came in uh, as uh, uh, alternative means of transport, uh, displaced the, the, the uh, delivery of uh, uh, goods and services or people using horses, and horses themselves were a source of pollution, the, uh, the, the animal droppings, the feces that were deposited. Uh, much of London was uh, ankle deep uh, in uh, the, um, uh, the um, refuse from these animals. And over time, we see that technological change replaced those uh, polluting activities uh, with, with perhaps new types of pollution, but over time, those have uh, tended to uh, be improved. Um, now, another important fact that people need to understand is that prosperity measured, for example, by per capita income allows people to finally reach the point to care about the environment because very poor people are so worried about feeding themselves and their children that they don't worry about the natural environment. It's only when you get to a certain level of comfort that you can begin to notice what's, what else is around you other than your perhaps starving children or the other sort of uh, unhappy conditions of life that you, so it's roughly in the neighborhood of $8,000 per capita per year where we see once countries get into that um, level of prosperity, then they care about the environment. And so we should applaud economic growth as giving a heightened sense of concern for human beings to engage the natural environment on its own terms and themselves be involved with trying to uh, uh, remediate or to mediate some of the problems. So, so what's the essence of this debate over the impact of, of capitalism on nature or the natural environment? Uh, what we need to do is, first of all, accept. I mean, I think it's unquestionable that everyone accepts that protecting or improving the natural environment, by that I mean nature, the things around us, these are things that we really should value. So we, we cannot live a good life if we leave, live in a deeply polluted uh, natural environment. But the problem is we need to be more conscious of how attempts to improve uh, or to protect the natural environment, what is the impact on what I call the human environment? In other words, the conditions of the individual human, uh, what's happened to their rights, what's happened to human liberty. These are things that we must take into account. So it's a balanced view that I'm asking for. The natural environment relative to the human environment. So we've got two uh, issues here uh, that uh, need to be addressed. So if the, the uh, uh, net, in, if, if the, if the end result of trying to protect and improve the natural environment is to have uh, a greatly reduced uh, quality of the human environment, then there'll be no real net gain. Because one of the reasons we want to have a nice natural environment is so that human beings can all of us enjoy uh, a life in that sort of you know, an improved set of conditions. So really in, behind our desire for a natural environment is that humans can cooperate and, and live uh, better within that. So it, if we think about what is the, the stance of the environmental movement or what is sometimes known as the green movement uh, is that in general, and now, of course, this may not uh, describe all of the motivations, but the, um, the, the general tendency is that capitalism and private property are the primary uh, cause of the decay of the natural environment. So we've seen this in the uh, uh, discussion about uh, pollution, 
um, air pollution or water pollution, or and, and more recently, climate change uh, is one of these aspects where um, humans are seen to have a very large impact on the natural environment through uh, the emission of carbon dioxide and other uh, so-called greenhouse gases. Now, it turns out the reality is, if we look carefully at history, certainly the history of the 20th century, the reality is that the worst environmental pollution, that is the pollution of the natural environment, is where we've seen either um, regulated industries where there was no competition that encouraged efficiency and conservation of resources, where we had poorly defined uh, property rights, or we had state control of property, that was where we had the worst destruction of nature. So for example, when I traveled in the former Soviet Union back in the 1980s, the industrial pollution was almost everywhere. Uh, there was very little regard for the natural environment. Uh, the only regard, primary regard, was for the uh, uh, fulfilling the quotas under the, the plan. Uh, the natural environment was not in the plan per se. Uh, in fact, it was often neglected uh, and, and, and completely overlooked. As I say, some of the worst pollution I've ever experienced, uh, uh, water and, and air pollution was in those, uh, or, or in China in the 1980s. Um, and there was even a book called Ecocide uh, that came out in the 1990s that, that looked at how state control uh, of resources led to this disastrous condition where the, um, the ecolog ecological disasters that emerged not out of capitalism, but out of uh, statism or collectivism or uh, socialism that we saw in these uh, former communist countries. So, and in fact, at that time where we saw improvements in air pollution and water pollution were in the capitalist country because number one, they had the motivation, that is people began to care about the environment. Number two, they had the means to, uh, they had the financial means uh, to clean up the environment. And progress has continued for the most part, uh, driven not by the dictates of the state, but by the uh, advancements in material comfort and uh, uh, standards of living brought about by capitalism and economic growth. Now, so, when governments attempt to improve the natural environment, this is a way, uh, it's not that much different from the state directed uh, interventions under socialism and communism. Uh, the, the, the analogy that's, or the, or the sort of metaphor or mem, if you will, for environmentalism was that of a watermelon, where it was green on the outside, meaning environmentally aware, but red on the inside being having some affection for or belief in a somewhat socialistic intervention, uh, red being a reference to, to, to the uh, Soviet communism uh, or socialist um, uh, control of um, resources. So, uh, and of course, this goes with heavy regulation of private actions, private ownership uh, and, uh, and uh, market uh, activities. The evaluation uh, is based upon what uh, Friedrich Hayek called scientism, uh, which was a, uh, a way of trying to use uh, to uh, manipulate science as though it was an objective process. Uh, science is not objective. There's no single truth that comes to us from science. Science is something that is constantly uh, must be contested. Uh, scientific consensus must be uh, treated in a great deal of skepticism. Claims for uh, scientific consensus are usually motivated by politics rather than 
uh, a, a um, deep knowledge or uh, affection for, for real science. And, and social engineering is, is one of the possible outcomes of, of this um, uh, scientific process. Now, it turns out that the National Socialists, the Nazis under Hitler, and the Communists, they both used a great deal of rhetoric to say that they were promoting the common good. And in order to do so, the individual would have to be subordinated to the goals, the ambitions of the state. So communism was no better and no worse in this regard than was National Socialism under Hitler. They both uh, approached it in the same manner. Uh, now, the, uh, what we see is if we look back under uh, uh, the, the fascism uh, under the National Socialists, uh, these guys were really early environmentalists because they 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 promoted many of the same sort of um, sort of idealistic outcomes for the natural environment with disregard for the human environment. And I think these disasters that we see under fascism or under communism are because of that disregard for the human environment. Individual liberty and personal rights were uh, either uh, reduced or eliminated uh, at considerable uh, cost to the cause of human development. Um, so there's also what we find is that uh, this idea of a so-called precautionary principle has run rampant in a way to the point where uh, the movement is towards almost zero risk. Uh, and to overlook how the costs have to be accounted for. Whereas the precautionary principle tends to say, we're trying to achieve this benefit. And so we will take these precautionary steps, but without really taking into account how extensive the cost might be to achieve that. And uh, so what we learn from this is that all human actions involve trade-offs. Uh, so we're not looking for perfection, we're looking for an optimum, but the only way you can get there is through a prudent interpretation of benefits and costs, that these have to be, and the seen and the unseen, not the intentions of the precautionary uh, measures, but what are the real effects? So if we look at, again, sorry to bring up the pandemic again, we, we know what the intended benefits are, that is to save lives, but in fact, the costs, uh, we save lives perhaps from uh, reducing uh, transmission of a, a, one single virus for a particular disease, uh, which is only one element of total health. Uh, but we overlooked how that, those policies had costs in terms of the mental health, which is another part of human health, and also the material well-being, which would undermine people's uh, capacity to, to leave, uh, live a good life. Now, it turns out that instead of this relying upon the state, there are other ways to approach solving problems relating to the natural environment. So it turns out that the natural environment is a shared goal uh, and markets will actually provide some incentives. They won't work perfectly well, there will be mistakes, but as I suggested to you, those mistakes themselves will tend to be self-correcting over time. It may take some time, but it, it comes partly because of rising incomes, getting people to the point where they care about the environment, where they want to see the environment to uh, natural environment to improve. So markets, uh, for example, one thing that could be done is that we could have tradable permits. For example, in terms of fishing rights, uh, people worry a great deal about the uh, depletion of global uh, uh, fishing, uh, global fish uh, and sea life. 
uh, it's possible to, to assign property rights to a particular uh, many uh, species of fish uh, live in schools. That is, they, they, they uh, like a herd. Uh, they could be with modern technology, electronically tagged, uh, and the property rights uh, over those could be protected because the, 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 the firm or the individual that possessed those rights would be able to trace their, their, uh, where those particular um, fish were and to protect them or to take action against anyone who would trespass on those rights. Uh, and we can also uh, grant rights to take a certain number of fish uh, and allow people to, uh, to, to, to buy and sell <clears throat> the right to take fish from the sea. So there, there are lots of ways that we could explore how we could use the market to actually bring about the uh, solution to some of these problems. Another one would be pollution, pollution charges. Uh, this is one that, um, um, that goes back to uh, uh, A.C. Pagu in the end of the 19th century, where he suggested uh, a tax on uh, the emission of uh, 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 particulate matter from smokestacks. Uh, and uh, we've seen carbon trading coming uh, out, out of that as well. Um, now, one of the interesting things, the United States has had the most success in reducing, in particular, carbon dioxide emissions and the general quality of the air, primarily by a technological improvement that came through market processes. And that is what is known as hydraulic fracturing or fracking, where a new technology that was developed not by the major oil companies like Exxon, but by individual uh, entrepreneurs engaged in uh, petroleum exploit, uh, exploration and exploitation, developed a new technique to uh, drill much deeper into the earth than previously and to be able to drill horizontally. And in doing so, they would you know, introduce uh, in particular water and some chemicals at very high pressure to fracture these uh, shale deposits and release uh, gas, natural gas and or liquid petroleum. And this natural gas, uh, uh, the, the increase in the production of natural gas in the US has allowed a lot of the utilities in the United States to move away from using coal as a primary uh, source of running their um, turbines to natural gas, which is, although a fossil fuel, it's a much cleaner one. And uh, this has led to an improvement where other countries that have dedicated themselves to using alternative fuels or alternative energy sources have not had as much success uh, as the US has in terms of reducing pollution and uh, improving the air quality. Now, so there are other things that might be done voluntarily without government mandates. For example, business-led approaches would be preferable because there's less bureaucracy. Uh, when governments are uh, determining environmental uh, policies relating to the natural environment, there tends to be they tend to be bureaucratic. That is, bureaucratic rules dominate, and the incentives for the bureaucrats and the politicians uh, are such that uh, there's less innovation available. Whereas under a business-led uh, approach to the natural environment, there'll be more innovation, much like in case of fracking. Uh, there'll be negotiated agreements rather than uh, compelled uh, arrangements and self-regulation rather than outside regulation that might be lead to over-regulation because the, the, the uh, state regulators don't have uh, enough information about the optimal level of this particular activity. They're making subjective determinations. 
and that uh, and private businesses can come up with voluntary codes uh, as a way of addressing uh, the natural environment. So where are the incentives for this? You know, why should we believe that the market will give us regulations? Uh, so in this sense, we're thinking of regulation as being either state mandated regulation or voluntary market led regulation. And it turns out that markets uh, do generate incentives for regulation. For example, uh, profit seeking encourages producers to be cost efficient. In other words, to try to maximize their profits. And as long as the state doesn't intervene to protect them against rivalry and competition, then this profit seeking process will actually encourage conservation as will private property ownership. Private property ownership uh, induces people to try to uh, create a, to take a long-term view of the value of that particular resource. Whereas state ownership of resources, uh, we see that um, this tends to lead to much more short-sighted um, uh, treatment of those resources. Now, it turns out that, that green consumers, that is people who are deeply uh, uh, engaged in their concern for the natural environment, will actually be willing to pay a higher price uh, for environmentally uh, friendly products. So this creates an incentive for businesses to actually respond. And uh, in fact, they can very often charge all, essentially a monopoly price because they know that these people will pay a, a, a higher price. So it provides an incentive for them to do so. The, the other thing that's very interesting about these voluntary regulations, uh, not just for the natural environment, but in, in general, is that it preempts government regulation. So in other words, voluntary market-led regulation is a substitute for government regulation. And it turns out that there's many things that uh, the, the, the private sector uh, regulates. For example, scuba diving. Uh, scuba diving is a, it's, uh, it's become a, a safe sport, but it is potentially dangerous. Uh, you're underwater and your, uh, your survival depends upon having good equipment, the right equipment. Well, the uh, PADI, P-A-D-I, uh, is a privately regulated organization uh, a, a private organization that regulates uh, scuba diving. So there's lots of uh, instances where the private sector provides very adequate uh, regulation that affects our daily lives. Uh, and we, we, we don't think of it. We only think of regulation as something that the state can do. Uh, in fact, that's false. Uh, there's also the idea of brand loyalty. That is, companies worry about their brand because the brand uh, the, the loyalty of their consumers to the brand is what generates uh, the share values, the market capitalization of a particular firm. So they'll tend to be sensitive to their image in terms of whether or not they are uh, engaging in production processes, for example, that uh, are uh, harmful or helpful to the natural environment. Now, what about restraining capitalism? Now, as I mentioned earlier, what we need to be alert to is that we don't want to protect the natural environment to the extent that we harm the human environment, because that will reduce the, the possibility for the economic growth that I mentioned earlier is necessary for us to be able to afford to rehabilitate the, uh, uh, the degradation that might have occurred uh, from the earlier stages of economic development. Now, what we've seen then is that there's a, the, the people who are, have a heightened sense of valuing the natural environment, uh, they tend to develop an intolerance towards hum, human beings in a sense. Uh, one of the famous conservationists uh, in the 1990s referred to humans. If we take that analogy, a cancer is something that you need to kill, that you need to remove, that the, 
the human body is better off if you take away, eliminate that cancer. Now, if humans are cancer to the natural environment, that means we should disappear. Now, this is a very strange uh, perspective on uh, humanity. That is, we should be eliminated. That is, the natural environment has greater value than the human environment, but, but the natural environment has no value without humans. The, the value of the natural environment is what we interpret it to be. It's our interaction with it that gives us this sense of value. It, it's not valued in a objective sense that it's just, um, this is a nonsense sort of concept. Now, what we've also seen, it's not quite as, as bad today as it once was in the United States, but so-called eco-tourism, terrorism, sorry, eco-terrorism uh, has been either tolerated or encouraged. That is, it's like, well, okay, so if we destroy people's private property to stop them from doing certain things, uh, that is acceptable because uh, their losses are offset by the gains to the natural environment. Uh, this is also a very strange calculus uh, that follows in many ways along the lines of what I've just described to you. Now, restricting or prohibiting uh, private action actually undermines the environmental awareness by restricting civil society. Now, civil society is a voluntary process where individuals interacting with one another try to find solutions independently and voluntarily and spontaneously. Civil society is one of the, 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 the uh, uh, admirable aspects of human interactions. Now, if the uh, state prohibits these private activities that would lead to civil society agreements, uh, then we'll be worse off for it. Um, and, and it will make people less desirous, actually, to take steps that could improve the natural environment. They'll become cynical. They'll say, what's in it for me? They'll resist. So, but if civil society determined, uh, if, if the process of the development of civil society works in such a manner that people look around, and they say, we'll all be better off if we uh, take this collective approach uh, to, to address these uh, concerns about the natural environment. Now, it, there is, there's also a very interesting uh, sense that on one hand, environmentalists, especially those that are involved with uh, uh, climate change, tend to believe that there is a scientific consensus. They insist that science is objective, that science should be the final word. However, when it comes to genetically mo modified organisms, GM food, for example, or nuclear power, they reject the science behind that. So, it, I mean, we need to understand that science is not objective in one set of conditions, climate change. Scientific consensus tells us that humans are the primary cause of climate change, but to reject science that shows us that genetically modified food does not cause people to grow a, a, a second nose from their forehead, uh, or that nuclear power is a, uh, uh, a, a, a threat to not only the natural environment, but the human environment, when uh, nuclear power has proven itself to be a much safer uh, way of developing energy with lower cost to the natural environment uh, than any other that we've developed up till now. So what we see then is that a lot of environmentalism uh, is driven by ideology. Government is a solution. Let's find a problem. Uh, and if we accept that approach, we're really uh, rejecting reason we're rejecting the, the possibility that there is another solution, that there is, uh, a, that we should keep looking for a better way. Um, and what we have unfortunately seen over time is that if you follow the money, virtually all the money that governments 
have set aside uh, relating to studies or inquiries into uh, questions about the natural environment have been toward those individual scientists uh, or groups of scientists that support state intervention. Um, now, you, you, you would have to believe that uh, I would not be hired by uh, governments to advise them on uh, in, uh, environmental policy. Uh, they'll find someone who is more congenial to the overall uh, uh, thrust of governments intervening uh, in order to correct these problems in the natural environment. So uh, what we've seen then is that just like with the pandemic policies, fear has been an instrument driving policy. That is public policies uh, have purposefully or uh, political agents have purposely used fear as a way to get people to accept oppression or, or restrictions, if you will, uh, and to give up resources. Uh, it's been very effective with the pandemic policy that people that uh, quite uh, too many, very many people who have bought into the fear uh, narrative uh, are willing to accept um, uh, uh, the, the uh, very tight restrictions on human liberty, whether in Australia where people are, uh, only can leave or enter the country, even as citizens, with explicit permission from the Australian government, the same in New Zealand, but also the same in North Korea or Cuba. These are places where we have extreme restrictions on human choices. So fear is a psychological uh, instrument that we should never, we should be terrified when governments use this. This should be the last regard. Government policy should be always about uniting us, about creating an atmosphere where we work together uh, cooperatively uh, and spontaneously, not to create a, an atmosphere of fear and paranoia where we will turn against each other and uh, snitch on each other. We'll inform, we'll tell the authorities that someone is doing something against uh, the, the, the uh, self-determined, subjectively determined uh, public sector goals. Now, if we look at the subset of economics that is known as public choice, which is the uh, interpretation of uh, political activities using uh, the, the lens of an economist, uh, this will give us some instructions about what's going on with this so-called climate action. Uh, now, the, uh, what we're being told is that we, we have to accept uh, certain limits on our behavior based upon informed judgments. Again, the same sort of terminology has been used with pandemic policies, but basically this is a way of inducing people either through fear or by appeal to authority that they must accept these restrictions. Uh, so this is used in, in place of explicit coercion. It's in, encouraging people to believe that what they're doing is in their best interest and to overlook what they're giving up in order to get there. So what's the motivation for this persistent sense of danger. And I, I mentioned it a, a bit earlier. Politicians and bureaucrats are more worried about being blamed if they do nothing than if they do something and they get bad results. So the same is true for environmental policies, policies that address the natural environment or policies that respond to a public health crisis. They're much more worried about being blamed for doing nothing than for blame being blamed uh, for doing the wrong thing. Because they say, well, we did it because we believed, we didn't know what the result was. But economics tells us that we must always look for the unseen effects. If they fail, and they do fail often, it's because they are reacting to political incentives 
rather than economic incentives that would uh, encourage them to make better judgments that would take into account not just the natural environment, but also the human environment, not just uh, one disease, but all aspects of individual health. Um, so it also turns out that state actors are beneficiaries of many of these policies. That is, they get more power, they can do more things, they have a larger group of people around them, uh, their salaries go up, and they get more resources. That is, they are able to attract, uh, a, 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 be awarded a, a larger budget, if you will. So again, it's not surprising that uh, the politician who now has, who's being viewed as a, a true leader because they're moving forward in these uh, policies to promote the natural environment or to protect public health, they, they acquire more power, more status, uh, and they're able to demand higher uh, sacrifices from the taxpayer uh, accordingly. Now, what are the concepts or ideologies behind this? So on one hand, we've got essentially uh, economic motivations where the power and the resources motivates politicians, but they're sometimes motivated by ideology. Now, what we've seen, uh, if you've paid attention to the uh, discussion since the beginning of the pandemic in early 2020, for example, the, the focus has been on the Great Reset or the so-called new normal. Now, these terms have come up time and time and time again. Now, there's an ideological content. The Great Reset means that what we were doing before needs to be replaced. It should be replaced. The new normal is what was normal before. We don't need that. We should never have had that. We don't want to go back to that. We have to be very careful. What are the implications of a Great Reset, of, of a new normal? Normal in according to what standards? Reset according to what standards? If these are ideological standards, we may be uh, at the risk of being taken down a path that we do not desire to go on. Uh, and it's being sneaked in on us. And I, I'm going to suggest to you here that the restrictions on human liberty that have been introduced in the name of public health during the pandemic are in a way a dress rehearsal for the kind of restrictions that will be imposed later in the name of the natural environment. So it, it was almost a test run. How much are people willing to give up? Uh, so if you terrify them with a public health threat, then you can use the same kind of fear tactics to develop the idea that the uh, the problems with the natural environment, for example, climate change, could be existential. So if it's existential to humankind, then we must do everything we can to, to stop that process. Um, so we need to be very much, concern, I think, concerned with that. Now, it turns out that when it comes to interpreting risks, uh, whether or not, what are the risks of continuing uh, a, uh, an, an economic system where we have expansive property rights and expansive human liberty? Uh, what are the risks to the natural environment of doing so? Uh, now, if we take the perspective of individuals or governments, we're gonna come up with different things. Now, if individuals are accepting risk, assessing risk, uh, what will happen is that if our interpretation of risk is too low, then there'll be high costs. On the other hand, if politicians, that is government or political actors, uh, if they set the um, um, uh, risks uh, as uh, too high, then uh, it's a, it comes at a low cost to them. Uh, so if they say that the, the risk uh, from damage to the natural environment means that uh, your job becomes non-essential, 
uh, building a pipeline, for example, that we 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 think that building pipelines to transmit uh, fossil fuels uh, is inappropriate and it's non essential. Well, there's no cost to the to the decider there. Uh, so it's easy for them to make decisions about what the risks are because they're not covering the costs personally or individually. And those costs are borne by someone else who may have a very weak political voice. Uh, now, if you try to reduce risks to zero, so if we want to have zero carbon, that's been a, or zero COVID, both of these have been ideas that have been floating around among politicians. Zero carbon, that is zero carbon dioxide, having alternative energy sources repl replace every bit of the fossil fuels that are, are now available, or zero COVID, meaning that we completely eliminate the virus uh, where it becomes uh, eradicated in the same way that smallpox was. <clears throat> what this overlooks is that the closer you get to zero, the higher the costs will become, and they will increase at an increasing rate. They'll become asymptotically uh, increasing. That is uh, something that, so the benefit of zero carbon overlooks the increasing costs of zero carbon, as does uh, zero COVID. As I mentioned, this idea of the precautionary principle, the, the so-called abundance of caution uh, is supposedly to make it sound like it's reasonable. But again, if you overlook the costs and you're only focusing on the, uh, the, the, the benefits that uh, are uh, suggested by that particular policy, uh, the, the, the human environment is almost certainly going to suffer. Now, it turns out that human interactions are extremely complex. We're changing uh, every day when we wake up. We wake up with a new set of uh, evaluations of what our means and ends will be. Um, it's part of the, the, the process of life and aging. We change over time. It's very difficult to control uh, these human interactions. Uh, now, it, the failure to control is, is in many ways because of the uh, the way that we select advisors, for example, in the United Kingdom, they uh, relied upon the so-called SAGE group uh, as advisors on pandemic policies. Now, they, if they'd chosen different advisors, they might have come up with significantly different approaches to uh, pandemic policies that might have had better results. Um, instead, what's happened is that they've had wave after wave of uh, infections, They've had wave after wave of lockdowns and restrictions that don't seem to have worked, but they keep going back to the same uh, game plan. Uh, the game plan has ne never been challenged. It's just that the, the plan wasn't followed long enough or hard enough. So they'll always go back to the same game plan. So what you wind up is what we could call a tyranny of experts. That is the expert opinion <clears throat> becomes sort of sacrosanct, it becomes sacred <clears throat> in the sense that it is not challenged or, or, or altered. <clears throat> so let me make a few concluding remarks here. Uh, first of all, climate action, which is uh, being in many ways uh, dressed up in this expression, uh, a great reset, is about expanding and globalizing and concentrating political power. So if we follow this, we're going to see that the increase in state regulation will lead to a degradation of the human environment. That is less human liberty, fewer resources because tax rates will go up both in the present and in the future, which means that people will have less after-tax income and they'll have less freedom to choose how to spend that less amount of after-tax income. So this is a, something that we should be alert to. Now, the negative externalities that exist uh, relating to the natural environment 
uh, if they don't assist in the assignment and the enforcement of private property rights, uh, it's going to create problems that could be solved either through, according to Ronald Coase, uh, a Nobel Prize winning economist, suggested that when we assign property rights, this is, gives us a possibility of solving a lot of externality problems. And because we can trade those property rights as a way of solving uh, the, the difficulties or issues with the natural environment. Or Eleanor o Ostrom, a political scientist who actually won a Nobel Prize in economics, <clears throat> saw that non-state, non-market community solutions could emerge uh, through a spontaneous process when it relates to uh, what are known as uh, collective consumption goods or community uh, goods used by a community. Now, so state regulation can interfere with other types of solutions. So there's three types of solution we could have. State regulation, which has its problems with rigidity, with subjective interpretation of scientific inputs or the uh, selection of arbitrary selection of particular experts. Or we could have uh, property rights solutions, according to uh, Ronald Coase, uh, using the so-called Coase theorem, or a third way of approaching uh, these collective action problems is to follow Eleanor Ostrom's um, uh, discussions about how uh, voluntary communities, uh, how co communities can voluntarily solve problems. So there is no tragedy of the commons. The, the idea of a tragedy of the commons was a misunderstanding of, of, of history that humans actually, when faced with those collective action problems, usually came up with solutions, even in absence of private property, and certainly in absence of state regulations. So uh, political authorities will always resist the, their reason for being. Their reason for being is to solve the things that, that you're afraid of. And they don't give up their power. That is this ratchet effect will be there because uh, state power expands, but it never contracts. If we want to have better outcomes, we actually need less state regulation of the nat natural environment uh, because if there's less state regulation, we'll have more economic growth. Uh, and that economic growth will actually be the means to reduce the current uh, uh, problems with the natural environment uh, and correct the past ones and to avoid future ones. Uh, so in other words, what we need to do if we're going to seek ways to improve the natural environment, we must not give in to a degradation of the human environment. Thank you very much. Time for questions. Thank you for your presentation. We'll move on to the question and answer segment. Um, so free market environmentalism seeks to ensure clearly defined property rights in order to solve environmental problems. Uh, but it seems that this is difficult in certain areas. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned how some elusive property rights in the ocean, um, specifically fishes, can be ensured through uh, technology. But perhaps the question still remains. So what is your response to the inherent logistical difficulties to to define property rights within the natural environment. Well, I I take the other, I take kind of a contrary approach. Um, what I unfortunately, state intervention in the natural environment is in a sense a laziness, in the such that we're we're not looking for other solutions. We should be well aware of the dangers of state intervention to promote the natural environment. The first thing we should do then is look for private solutions, that is through market incentives. And if we exhaust all of those by continuing experimenting with them, uh, then we turn to state regulation. So, but we're doing the opposite. 
what's happened is that state regulation has become the, the default position rather than the second best solution. And it is a second best solution at, at most uh, because of the difficulties in terms of the rigidities. Uh, once you get them, the, the ratchet effect, uh, the likelihood that, that they'll not only persist, but they'll actually increase over time even if mistakes are made, because very often what happens is that politician will say that it's not working because we didn't do enough yet. Trust us, let us do more, it'll get better later. And it, it may not, and almost certainly won't. So speaking of the management of resources, um, one common solution that some environmentalists have turned to is the idea of the circular economy. So the circular economy strives to um, keep waste to an absolute minimum and to reuse resources for as long as possible. Um, from a free market uh, perspective, what are your thoughts um, about this shift in paradigm? Well, you know, I, the, the idea of um, conservation is at the heart of profit-seeking capitalism. That is, the capitalists that waste resources will earn fewer profits. So it doesn't mean it's perfect, but it is a way of encouraging uh, conservation. The same with private property. We find that the, the in, in the United States, the only wilderness forest that exists today that's never been cut is private land. Uh, it's not on government land. Uh, because what happens is if you own something you have a strong incentive to protect it, to husband that resource so that its value will increase over time for you or your family or your friends. Um, now, the idea of say, recycling. Uh, now, the, the public attempts at recycling, whether or not it's through local governments or national governments have been a, a failure in the sense that they ignored economic signals. What happened over time as, as the, uh, in the case of newsprint, uh, the increased recycling of newsprint shifted the supply curve so far to the right that the, the market value of newsprint became negative. Uh, uh, or in the case of, um, uh, I read recently in New York City, uh, the, the, the cost of actually uh, separating uh, rubbish and, and trying to recycle it uh, and the cost of transporting and so on was such that although they told people to keep doing it, the, 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 the uh, waste collectors were simply putting it all in the same landfill and not recycling it uh, or not recycling all of it. So we have to be careful that these sort of ideas uh, are based or grounded in human realities, which to me are the, the human interactions primarily that we will find through pro private property-based uh, free market capitalism within the context of the rule of law. So then um, what can free market environment, environmentalism do for the problem of resource depletion? Um, I mean, we understand well that uh, there are fundamental physical limitations of the planet. There's only so much land space, there's only so much oil in the ground. And at some point, you know, these will eventually run out. So should this be a cause for concern? Well, uh, Julian Simon was a, an outstanding economist whose book, uh, the ultimate resource, pointed out that throughout human history, we've encountered insurmountable limits that were surmounted. That is, we saw an impossible situation that human ingenuity resolved. And so this occurred primarily through, for example, economic impulses where uh, relative prices inspired changes in either production behavior or the supply side or the demand side of a 
um, relating to a particular resource. And so um, whether it's land, I mean, of course, the, 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 in Holland, they faced a severe shortage of land. They solved the problem with technology and expanded. Of course, there's, there are limits, but uh, uh, one of the other ways of resolving that is to, um, to build uh, vertically instead of horizontally. So the limits on land are, are, again, only limited by your imagination. The limits on natural resources, uh, we've, we've had so-called peak oil, where the total amount of the known reserves of petroleum in the ground has gone up and up and up and up. The peak oil has always been violated. Uh, and eventually, uh, we will stop using oil for some reason. Technology will allow it. So uh, even reaching a, an outer limit of a particular resource will probably be taken care of either by technology and or um, relative prices. Now, it's interesting to me that human ingenuity, human creativity, human ideas are perhaps the only thing that I've ever encountered that violates the economic law of scarcity. That is, you have to give up something in order to have more of it. It turns out people just have ideas. They don't know why, they invent, they don't know why. Sometimes it's motivated by market impulses, but people just come up with new and better things to do uh, just because of curiosity. So I, I'm very optimistic. And I think that people, the environmentalists are pessimistic people. They don't like human beings, generally. They don't like the outcomes of other people behaving freely and openly. And so they're, they're sort of like uh, agony ants. Uh, these, you know, someone who agonizes over everything uh, and, and complains about uh, the outcomes of other people's behavior. So I'm very optimistic. I think being an economist gives you that sense of optimism about the future of humanity and the future of the natural environment. So Many claim that um, carbon taxes are a good hybrid solution between government intervention and the use of market incentives. Um, what do you say about this? Well, uh, carbon taxes would have to, to, for them to work well, you'd have to know what is an acceptable level of carbon output. Nobody knows, it's subjective. Uh, uh, what is the, uh, the source of the carbon output? Uh, uh, again, we, we see that uh, the burning of natural gas is much more effective and efficient uh, than in terms of uh, carbon output, uh, than burning of coal or wood or uh, animal dung. Um, so what we, what we should be looking at are not trying to, and, and then you have to have the, the appropriate amount of tax. Then you have to have uh, the fact that those taxes are actually used for the purposes they were intended, that is to make the natural environment better. And in fact, we know that's not true. Politicians don't spend money on uh, anything unless it makes it easier for them to be reelected or elected. Uh, and it turns out that as long as there is a need for uh, protection or improvement of natural environment, they, they will use that as a way of trying to uh, encourage people to pay higher taxes, either through a carbon tax or any other tax. Uh, taxes are fungible. You know, it, it, it's, it's an illusion to think that those carbon taxes will be directed towards uh, the improvement of the natural environment. So I think it's a bit of a red herring. 